Okay, please. Okay. Um, thanks, Mattia, for that very kind introduction and, and Federico for giving me the chance to share my work with you all. And also thanks to all of you for providing, um, you know, a very sustaining intellectual community during the pandemic. It was nice to have something to look forward to, to think about and people to think with. Okay. So when scholars talk about the politics of the Middle Republic, they tend to focus on things that happened at Rome, the Senate, elected magistrates, assemblies, the role of the people, and so on. But to restrict politics in this period to what happened in the city of Rome is to tell only part of the story. Through the violent process of conquest in the third and second centuries BCE, not only did Rome transform from an Italic city-state into an empire, but its political entanglements were upsized as well. Not only did it bring new actors, individual and collective into the picture, but it posed a series of questions as to how they would relate to one another. What kind of relationship did the Roman state and its institutions want to develop with newly conquered regions? And on what basis would such decisions be made? How did people who had been coerced, sorry, who had coercively brought, been brought under Roman control respond and react to their new position as subjects? How did local politics shift now that Rome was notionally in charge? And how involved did the Romans want to be in such matters? The answers to these questions are complex and various and naturally have been subject to much scholarly debate. My goal in this talk is to add to this very rich discussion by highlighting the role that Roman soldiers, particularly allied and auxiliary troops, played in shaping the politics of this rapidly changing Mediterranean world. I want to show how they use how soldiers use military service as an opportunity to take part in both global and local politics. Soldiers took collective action to push back against Roman structures of power, to affirm the dominance of the polity, the, to affirm the dominance of the polities to which they belonged, and to question decisions made by local elites. Moreover, certain realities of military service, such as the conscription of recently conquered people, the tendency to deploy such groups without direct oversight from the Roman state, and the constant presence of an enemy enabled and empowered allied and auxiliary soldiers to take politically motivated action. So let's start our examination of the political power that allied and auxiliary soldiers had during the Middle Republic by considering a little discussed conspiracy um, that broke out during the First Punic War. In 259 BCE, a group of 4,000 Soki Nawales and 3,000 slaves who were housed in the city conspired to burn Rome to the ground. According to the two sources that record the incident, Erosius and the Zenaris, had the plot been, not been detected, it would have resulted in Rome coming under control of the plot's masterminds. And here are the two sources that we have on this event. Now, in spite of the seriousness of the threat, neither of these two sources that I've put up here provide much in the way of detail about the plot or those involved. The episode exists as nothing more than a fragment of recorded history. The incident gets only a brief mention in two very late sources. Further problems emerge when we consider the specific actors in the incident. Our sources provide little information about who took part in the conspiracy. Um, further, we hear nothing about what became of those involved in the incident. This combination of factors has rendered the conspiracy effectively illegible in terms of the modern historian's toolkit. And unsurprisingly then, the episode and its potential political implications have received little attention from modern scholars. So, is there anything that we can do in situations like these to excavate the motivations and rationale behind incidents such as the conspiracy of 259? Clearly a very important political moment. And here I think we can rely on some of the theoretical approaches that modern historians of popular power have outlined for us. Indeed, the way that our sources have recalled the conspiracy of 259 fits a larger pattern in the history of the Roman Republic and beyond. That is the historical archive because of its creators and keepers um, being invested in maintaining current structures of power and the fact that they're fearful 
of mass political action have tended to either exclude or render illegible acts of popular power. So to counter this erasure, some modern historians, um, most notably Depeche Chakraborty, a, a historian of popular power in the colonial subcontinent, has offered two suggestions, and I'm going to be following these suggestions throughout my paper. The first of these, which is um, rather more ideological in nature, contends that historians must start by recognizing collective actions as fundamentally political. They reveal the power that non-elite groups possess and the tactics that they, can that they employ can provide and put pressure on the state and its institutions. Chakrabarthi's second suggestion is more of a formal one. He proposes that historians make use of what Hayden White called the middle voice in writing accounts of non-elite collective action. White's middle voice, so named after the eponymous verbal characteristic in ancient Greek, attempts to straddle the line between an objective history defined by linear rational thinking and a more subjective history in which the historian attempts to quote, go native and to articulate what is at stake for the participants in the event. According to Chakrabarthy, White's middle voice offers a way for the historian to deploy their traditional toolkit, but also remain cognizant of the ways in which these ideologies and methodologies suppress and subvert the actions of the non-elite. Okay. So what I want us to do here is to try to push beyond the limits of our historical archive and follow Chakrabarthy's lead by offering a political reading of the conspiracy of 259, okay? And I wanna to try to articulate the different factors that were at stake for the participants in the event. So I wanna start here by thinking about the identity of who was involved in this event. And as I think it provides a useful entry point for considering the political nature of these actions. So, while, as you can see, Orosius offers very little information about who the sailors were um, who were involved in this conspiracy, Zenorus is a bit more forthcoming. He tells us that the group of Shoki Nawales who were involved hailed from Samnium. And Thiel, in his study on the Republican army, has noted that um, the deployment of Samnite, oops, sorry, I did not mean to go forward there of Samnites in Rome's navies was something unusual and spoke to the real difficulties facing the Republic in 259 BCE. As for the enslaved people who took part in this conspiracy, Zenorus also adds that the group consisted of men who had been recently captured in war and sold into slavery. Aloi te ton halonton kai ento aste duleonton. The presence of the Samnites in the conspiracy is significant due to the nature of their contentious relationship with Rome. Indeed, the Samnites had spent the better part of the second half of the fourth century, as well as the opening decades of the third at war with Rome. And even after the Romans completed their conquest of Samnium in 290, the Samnites continued to push back against their new hegemons. Between 282 and 272, only a decade after the conclusion of the Third Samnite War, the Samnites rose up in revolt, joining Tarentum, the Brutians, and the Lucanians in their war against Rome. Nor did this mark the end of Samnite resistance. In 269, the Carasani, the northernmost of the Samnite tribes, supported and housed Lollius and his, his supposed band of brigands in their robbing and pillaging of the Roman countryside. And according to Zenorus, there is allegedly some level of Samnite support for the revolt of the Etruscan town of Volsinii in 265. And we should add that even if we think a little bit more forward, 50 years later, a number of Samnite tribes such as the Herpini and the Caudini defected to Hannibal in the aftermath of the Battle of Cannae. These tribes suffered Pretty serious repercussions, the Romans appear to have confiscated a large amount of land from them in the early second century BCE. The history of animosity between the Samnites and the Romans helps to contextualize the plot of 259. The Samnites who plotted this conspiracy were not only the sons and grandsons of men who had spent their entire lives trying to put a stop to Roman expansion into the Apennines, but they themselves had seen and maybe even participated in 
attempts by their fellow countrymen to cast off the yoke of Roman rule. And again, while we can't say for sure, it's certainly possible that it was their sons and grandsons who took part in a conspiracy who were behind the decision, um, who, sorry, the sons and grandson, there it was their sons and grandsons who were behind the decision to defect from Rome during the Hannibalic War. The long history of Samnite resistance against Roman rule makes it different to interpret the collective action taken by these sailors as an exceptional event. The conspiracy, I think, is better read as an act of political resistance so that offers another plot point in the long history of Samnite attempts to break free from Roman rule. Now, as we can see from the Zenaris expert, not uh, excerpt, sorry, not every Samnite in this troop was on board with the plot. According to Zenaris, Herius Poitilius, who is described as the leader of the allies, Hoothes Botheas Archon, was not initially a part of the conspiracy and only found out about the plot after the planning was well underway. After he learned of the plan to destroy the city, Herius feigned support of the endeavor to gain further information about what the soldiers hoped to do. Armed with the details of the plot, Herius constructed an elaborate ruse to ensure that he would have the opportunity to speak in front of the Senate without causing suspicion among his troops. Herius convinced the sailors to assemble in the forum and complain publicly about the lack of grain they had received from the Roman state while the Senate was in session. As a result of the disturbance, Herius got his wish and was summoned to the Senate. There he betrayed the intentions of his men to attack the city, allowing the Senate to take action and snuff out the conspiracy before it could be brought to fruition. That Herius, oops, sorry, that, um, oops, there we go, sorry. That Herius was initially left out of the conspiracy and upon learning of it informed the Senate of the plot reveals another political aspect to the plot. His actions speak to the fact that there were a differing set of beliefs among the Samnites as to how they should deal with Roman hegemony. Some, like Herius, seem to have believed that it was necessary to move forward and build a good relationship with their conquerors. While others, as made manifest but in the action of the conspirators, continue to look for opportunities to break free from Roman control. The factors that conditioned this difference in opinion were various and complex. And one reason we might posit related to the tribes to which the sailors belong to. We know that during the Second Punic War, as we discussed above, some Samnite tribes like the Pentry remained loyal to the Romans, while others like the Herpini and Caudini gave support to Hannibal. There's also reason to believe that the varying attitudes towards Roman rule among the Samnite sailors were a result of socio-political difference. Herius is strongly suggested by the fact that he was commander of the troop, was a member of the Samnite elite. As Terranato has recently shown, one factor that enabled the establishment of Roman hegemony over the Italic Peninsula in the fourth and third centuries BCE and maintained its position of power in the centuries that followed was the close relationship that formed between Italians and the Roman elites. Indeed, Terranato contends that Italian elites made quote, a grand bargain, unquote, with their Roman counterparts that ensured their social standing um, within their communities would not only be preserved, but advanced under Roman hegemony. And while Terranato does not focus much on how the Samnite elite use Roman hegemony as an opportunity to advance their own status, we know that they did avail themselves of these advantages. For instance, Livy mentions how the Mopsii had achieved preeminence in the town of Comsa by the time of the Second Punic War due to the support and the favor of the Roman elite. Moreover, not only had the Mopsiids thrived as a result of Roman support, but they also faced internal opposition as a result of their pro-Roman stance. So to return to the conspiracy, we should read it not just as an act of resistance against Roman hegemon hegemony, but an act shaped by local political alignments as well. It reflected the, co the complexities of Romano-Samnite relations and the various factors such as tribal identifications and social political status that mediated these relationships. Now, the Samnite actors, Samnite sailors, sorry, did not act alone. As noted above, 
they were aided in the conspiracy by a large number of slaves who were also located at Rome. Now, Thiel, again, in his work on um, the Roman Republican Navy, has suggested that the slaves mentioned here were part of the naval force that was to be deployed against the Carthaginians. His argument is based on the fact that the conspiracy was hatched at Rome, where the Samnite sail sailors had been gathering for training and deployment, and that there were numerous examples of enslaved men and freedmen being press ganged into service in the Republican Navy. Now, if Thiel's conjecture is correct, the enslaved individuals would have spent time training with Samnite sailors, time that would have worked to create some sense of cohesion among the Samnite sailors and their enslaved counterparts, and thereby created the necessary lines of communication for coordinating this conspiracy. Now, um, this is a bit controversial. Laverne has pointed out that the claim that the slaves had already been deployed as sailors is problematic because of what Zenorus himself tells us. It's, um, Zenorus tells us that after the plot was detected, it was the enslavers of the um, group of slaves who revolted that ultimately arrested them. And this form of justice would seem to suggest that the enslaved people involved were not under the control of a Roman structure of power, but rather were remaining in the households of private individuals. So while we ultimately must be unsure as to whether these, sailor, these slaves were meant to serve in the galleys with the Samnites, their status as captives does help us to understand one of the reasons why they might've joined the Samnite cause. Although Zenaris doesn't offer details as to the circumstances of their capture, we can infer based on what we know of Roman warfare during the previous 20 years, that these men were either taken during Rome's attempts to solidify its hegemony over Southern Italy, or in the initial battles of the First Punic War. Wherever they came from, the captives involved in the conspiracy certainly felt a strong sense of animosity towards Rome. Rome's imperial endeavors had impinged directly on their communal and personal freedoms. And by participating in the conspiracy, they were seizing upon opportunities to free themselves from slavery and harm Rome's imperial apparatus in the process. Positing such motivations on a part of these captured slaves is more than just conjecture. There are in fact other examples of captives taking collective action as a form of redress against their conquerors. For instance, Livy reports that it was a group of Carthaginian captives that were responsible for a slave revolt that broke out near Setia in 198 BCE. According to Livy, these captives worked with, with Carthaginian political hostages who were imprisoned nearby and planned an attack against their masters while they were participating in a local festival. What we see in the, the collaboration between the slaves and the sailors is a concerted attempt by conquered peoples, both free and enslaved, to push back against the consequences of Roman hegemony. Moreover, we can observe the potential that popular acts of resistance had for inspiring other oppressed groups to engage in politically minded action. So to kind of summarize this particular episode, beyond gaining a, a deeper appreciation for the particular um, ins and outs of this incident. Um, reading the, cons the Samnite conspiracy in this way sets the table for a larger reimagining of the politics of military service for non-Roman soldiers. The actions of allied and auxiliary soldiers who served in Roman armies are hard to locate in the historical record. Their participation in other collective acts and motivations for doing so is masked, as we've discussed before, by the biases of our sources. In their eagerness to minimize the collective acts taken by Roman soldiers, ancient authors uh, mention actions involving Ro allied and Roman, and sorry, allied and auxiliary soldiers in passing, or, or erase the identity of the different groups involved by depicting the rebellious soldiers simply as mobs. As such, our sources render illegible the manifold political manifestation, sorry, motivations that lay behind these actions, and thereby deny the political agency of those involved. The political motivation of Samnite sailors in the conspiracy of 259 offer us new ways of reading the actions of allied and auxiliary soldiers in spite of the limitations of our historical archive. We are invited to see military service as a space for allied and auxiliary soldiers to push back against Roman rule and to insert themselves in local political debates as well. 
Furthermore, we are encouraged to consider that these actions were legible to groups outside the Roman camp, serving as a springboard to further political action. Um, in, in the rest of the talk, I wanna substantiate this point of view in, in two ways. I'll offer a number of politically oriented readings of collected act, collective action taken by non-Roman soldiers and situate them within the broader context of Roman military service in the third and second century BCE. I'll show that the very nature of Rome's military apparatus and its obligations empowered non-Roman soldiers to take political action. Okay, so one way in which the um, structures of the Roman army conditioned politically motivated action was the way they recruited and deployed their soldiers. While scholars have long remarked upon Roman dependence on non-citizen soldiers, it's worth noting that during the third and second centuries BCE, this dependence brought with it an additional layer of baggage. As we saw in the case of the Samnite soldiers in the first Punic War, the Romans relied upon soldiers from regions that had only recently been conquered or had a long standing history of animosity towards Rome. Polybius's famous description of Roman manpower on the eve of the Celtic War in 225, and I put it up here, brings the realities of Roman dependence on such groups into further relief. In the passage, Polybius mentions soldiers recruited from regions of Italy that have been fully conquered only in that last half century, like the Apulians, the Messapians, the Lucanians, and the Etruscans, as well as a large group of men recruited from Rome's longtime rival, the Samnites. We should add that Polybius' snapshot of Roman manpower also omits any Celtic auxiliaries that it might have been forcibly coerced to provide troops in support of Roman endeavors in the region after they had been subdued. But it wasn't simply that men who were recruited from these populations um, might harbor ill will towards Rome, and um, but also that the Romans had organized their individual units by ethnicity. Ethnically based deployments were in some ways an advantage for the Romans. It added a level of depth to the connections that naturally formed as a result of living and working together um, with one another. And it incentivized soldiers to fight bravely in hopes of achieving local honor for their service. But there were some serious downsides as well. In the case of troops who were recruited from groups with long histories of animosity towards Rome, the bonds of shared ethnicity, history, and language that enabled Roman units to be so effective on a, on a, uh, on a collective level on the battlefield also made them a threat to take si similar action with a view towards pushing back against Roman rule. We can see a clear example of how these different factors might interact in an incident from the Second Punic War. So in 218, shortly after Hannibal's descent from the Alps, Livy and Polybius record a defection of a contingent of over 2,000 Celtic soldiers serving in Cornelius Scipio's army. Just days before the Battle of Trebia, these soldiers made a dangerous escape from the Roman encampment at Placentia in the middle of the night, killing a number of Roman soldiers in the process and fleeing to Hannibal. The Carthaginian commander received them happily, but did not immediately incorporate them in his army, instead ordering them to return home. The return of these soldiers and the news of their deeds set off something of a chain reaction. Livy and Polybius report that, the, that a number of Celtic towns went over to the Carthaginian side in the immediate aftermath of the defection. Moreover, Polybius adds that the Romans feared that this action would serve as an incitement not just for their fellow Celts, but would also convince the Gauls to do the same. Here again, we see another example of how politically minded collective action undertaken by Roman soldiers was capable of inciting other groups to do the same as well. So um, our two sources on this incident, Livy and Polybius, do offer different explanations when they're trying to explain why the Celts defected. Polybius states that the Celtic defection happened because the soldiers serving in Cornelius's army had made the determination that Carthage was the stronger of the two powers, as you can see here. While Livy suggests, on the other hand, that their behavior was primarily driven by strongly anti-Roman sentiment. While these two explanations should not be seen as mutually exclusive, Livy's interpretation of Celtic motivations appears to be 
more evidentiarily founded. For instance, Polybius reports that the Celts not only killed the Roman sentinels, but as we see here, decapitated them as well. According to Diodorus and Strabo, decapitation of one's enemy was a culturally meaningful practice for the Celts. And recent archeological finds of embalmed he heads at Celtic sites has substantiated this point of view. The decapitations thus frame this defection as more than just a decision uh, motivated by rational calculation. Rather, the actions were a declaration of war against the Romans, and perhaps more importantly, a clear assertion of Celtic identity in, their, in the very act. The broader context supports this reading as well. In addition to the long history of Celtic animosity towards the Romans as a result of the Republic's northward expansion, the two sides had only recently concluded their most recent conflict. It was three years earlier. Furthermore, the very same group of Celtic communities that went over to Hannibal as a result of the defection continued to push back against Roman rule even after the conclusion of the Second Punic War. Livy reports that the Insubres, the Kenamani, the Boii, and the Ligurian tribes um, took, up tr took up arms against Rome in 200, sacking the Roman colony at Placentia before the rebellion was put to an end by the consul Aurelius. Hostilities between the Romans and Celtic tribes continued off and on for the next 50 years. In contrast to this consistently oppositional behavior, Celtic support for Hannibal and the Carthaginians was pretty unreliable. Indeed, not only uh, was Celtic aid for, Carthaginian, for the Carthaginians spotty at the war's outset, but it appears to have petered out over the course of the conflict. When considered in light of these broader historical circumstances, and the fact that the action taken by the soldiers incited an even larger revolt, it seems clear that the political, that political animus towards Roman rule was a major motivating factor in, the, uh, in this revolt. The episode involving the Celts also um, offers important insights into the ways that collective cohesion and cooperation that the organization of Rome's units fostered um, help non-Roman soldiers to engage in politically motivated action. Um, so you can see here, um, bolded on this, on this slide, there's some language that makes us think that. So Polybius frames the action taken by the Celtic soldiers as one based in collective consensus. He says, hoide sustratomenoi Celtoi theropontes. Um, the collective nature of their action is further reinforced by Polybius's description of their preparations in advance of the defection. He notes that the soldiers were organized in their deliberations and were quickly able to reach collective consensus about their plan of action. And again, in Greek, syntaxomenoi pros alelus chiron epiteron pros tes uh, epitesin. Polybius also adds the coherence of Celtic plans was facilitated by the layout of their camp. Okay, and that again here is highlighted in the passage. Since the auxiliary troops lived together, all these meetings were able to take place without the soldiers leaving their tents. Okay, menontos entais heauton ekastoi skenes. Polybius further reinforces the role that shared physical, physical space played in the defection in his description of the initial maneuvers undertaken by the Celts. Their first move was, the, was to slaughter the Roman soldiers who lived next to them. His account shows that the physical realities of Roman military service helped to facilitate the organization and planning of collective action. We see another example of how Roman recruitment practices could backfire later in the same war. Appian records that in two, uh, 203 BCE, a number of soldiers in Scipio's army in Africa conspired to set fire to the commander's tent. However, just as in the case of the Samnite conspiracy 50 years earlier, the plot was uncovered before it could be brought into action. One of the slaves of the Roman knights who had learned of the conspiracy uh, feigned his complicity to gain for, uh, further knowledge of it and reported it to his enslaver. The knight then relayed the information to Scipio, who had the conspirators summarily executed and their bodies cast from camp. That the plot of the soldiers from Hispania as politically, um, can be seen as politically motivated is strongly suggested by the details Appian provides. First, 
Um, Appian describes the men involved as unwilling recruit, uh, recruits. Poloi Scipioni Sunesin Hiberes Acontes, who had been conscripted from towns that had been actively resistant to Rome in the years immediately prior to their service, right? So we're talking about new recruits who had been coerced and forced into military service from towns that had recently been conquered and previously been fighting against Rome. A second reason we might see this as politically motivated is that the attack was aimed at Scipio, the representative of the Roman state within the camp, and the man who was also directly responsible for the conquest of their homelands and their forced conscription. So although the plot was ultimately foiled, we see once again how Rome's decision to prioritize an expedient recruitment process rather than employ a more cautious approach to conscription backfired. In this case, however, it was not just Roman dependence on former enemies that led to disastrous consequences. There's actually another factor um, at play as well. According to Appian, Carth the Carthaginian commanders who were encamped nearby caught wind of the frustration of the soldiers from Hispania and set out to turn their feelings into actions. They sent over a messenger in the guise of a deserter to convince the soldiers to take part in a plot to set fire to Scipio's tent. And while the recruitment and deployment of recently conquered people created a situation where soldiers could come together and re redress their collective grievances, it was the little extra push from the Carthaginians that provided the kind of activation energy necessary to turn their frustrations into a larger plot. Now, the Carthaginian influence here is important because it highlights Another aspect of military service in this period that enabled political action on the part of allied and auxiliary soldiers, the presence of an enemy. In the Middle Republic, Roman armies had not yet become the administrative police force that they would in the empire and were rather engaged in imperial expansion. And that meant they were actively fighting against a defined enemy. Now, an enemy in close proximity to, to the Roman army provided a visible alternative to the current state of affairs under which soldiers were serving. Moreover, this alternative was very accessible and attainable. Not only were enemy forces nearby, but they were eager to engage with and negotiate with members of the opposing army for a variety of reasons. Enemy soldiers could act as double agents or decoys, provide critical intelligence about certain operations, and as we saw in the case of Spanish soldiers, foment active resistance. The inherent value that allied and auxiliary soldiers possessed and their proximity to the enemy gave them the ability to take actions that advance their own political interests. Um, the most common way we can sort of think of allied and auxiliary soldiers availing themselves of such, opportun of such political opportunities was defection. Our sources, though they provide far from a complete record of the phenomenon, give us the strong sense that defection was rather commonplace during the Middle Republic. Roman commanders, upon coming to terms with an enemy, almost always requested that the defeated party hand over any defectors in their ranks. Similarly, we often hear of defectors being recovered upon the taking of an enemy city. What's more, it appears that on balance, allied and auxiliary soldiers were much more likely to defect than their legionary counterparts. Roughly half of the 39 instances where defection is mentioned in our sources explicitly note the presence of allied and auxiliary defectors in the ranks of the recovered soldiers. Now, defection was on an ontological level fundamentally political in nature. Not only was it a violation of the oath that all Roman soldiers swore um, upon entering ar the army that they would obey a magistrate in charge of it, um, but it also amounted in the case of non-Roman soldiers to an outright rejection of any pre-existing agreements between their home polity and Rome. Indeed, the Romans considered the behavior of defection to be treasonous and require that any offending parties either be permanently marked for their action through cor corporal punishment or totally excised from the community through the capital punishment. However, while defection was political in its essence, it should be admitted that not all of acts of defection were politically motivated. 
There were a whole host of reasons why soldiers might defect in antiquity, aside from a sense of frustration with local or global politics. Soldiers might defect to protect themselves from imminent slaughter, to gain financial benefits, or join the party they believe to be most likely to win the upcoming battle or war. To make matters more complicated, our sources rarely mention uh, why soldiers decided to defect. And frequently they don't tell us if the soldiers involved in the defection were Roman citizen soldiers or not. Consequently, assessing the frequency of politically motivated defection among allied and auxiliary soldiers requires more sort of direct contextualization as we did in the case of the Celtic defection. Yet, I think in spite of these epistemological difficulties, there are nevertheless a number of instances where the broader context suggests that defection is best interpreted as politically motivated. For instance, we can see um, a very clear act of political resistance from in the fourth century BCE, in which a group of Feliscan soldiers who were serving in the Roman army joined the army of the Tarquinians. This defection not only helped out their fellow Etruscans in their attempts to forestall Roman expansion, but had a larger political impact as well. The actions incited the rest of the Felisci to take part in a full-scale rebellion against Rome. Similarly, in 214, we hear of soldiers that might have defected under similar circumstances. According to Livy, when Fabius Maximus marched into the territory of the Samnites to attack the cities of the Caudini that had revolted from Rome after the Battle of Cannae, he found 370 deserters who, had, who he had summarily scourged in the forum and flung from the Tarpeian rock. While we hear nothing of the identity of these men except for their status as transfugi, the fact that they did not flee to an opposing army suggests that the defection was likely not conditioned by a more immediate circumstance like fear of dying in battle. Moreover, the choice to defect to these revolting towns and, the subsequent, and their subsequent acceptance of these defectors speaks to a shared political goal of resistance against Roman rule. Indeed, in the case of these revolting towns, the utmost care was needed when taking in soldiers who had served in armies of their putative enemy, because it was common practice for ancient armies to send out false deserters to serve as double agents. The extent to which animosity might, um, towards Rome might motivate defection can be seen most clearly in an anecdote from the Second Macedonian War. Here, Livy reports that during an attack on Corinth, Roman forces engaged in a hard fought battle against a group of Italian defectors. According to Livy, these men had not joined Philip V's forces during the Roman invasion of Greece. Rather, they had first defected to Hannibal during the Second Punic War and later joined Philip's army to avoid punishment at the hands of the Romans. Livy's explanation, however, is suspect. For one, the Romans did not declare war on Philip until March of 200 BCE, nearly 16 months after the victory at the Battle of Zama, and a full war after, sorry, a full year after the war's official conclusion. Moreover, we know that while Roman punishments for defection were notoriously brutal, um, these punishments almost always occurred in the context of an ongoing war for the purpose of deterring other soldiers from doing the same. In other words, these Italian soldiers were not particularly likely to be disciplined from their, for their action a year after the fact. In this particular context, the decision to continue to support states that were hostile to Roman expansion through military service speaks strongly to an anti-Roman sentiment. There were certainly other ways that these men might have avoided punishment that would not have required them to take up arms against Rome. Politically motivated defection on a part of the soldiers was not less necessarily limited in scope to anti-Roman se sentiment, however. As Michael Fronda has shown in his exposition of the behavior of Greek city-states in Southern Italy during the Second Punic War, warfare allowed communities to reframe, the power relation, to reframe power relations on a local level by changing allegiances. While historical animosity between localities might have to remain at bay in more peaceful circumstances for fear of Roman intervention, the presence of an enemy in one's regions, as was the case for the Southern Italic communities during the Second Punic War, created an opportunity for action. Fronda has shown that whether a community or particular faction within a community sided with Rome or Carthage was very closely tied to, the, to um, decisions made by their local rivals. 
For example, while the Apulian town of Arpi was the first Italian ally to break ranks and side with the Carthaginians, its local rivals, Canusium and Teanum Apulum, chose not to follow suit, but rather to remain loyal to the Romans. As Fronda highlights, while the geopolitics of, these, of the decision made by these communities during the Second Punic War were at odds with what happened during the Samnite War. Arpi had remained loyal to Rome in that circumstance, while Canusium and Teanum uh, Apulum had not. So what we see is that the local politics, that is the rivalry between Arpi and Canusium and Teanum Apulum, remain constant throughout these wars. As such, Fronda concludes that it was local rather than global matters that determined the behavior of allied communities when it came to the question of whether they should remain loyal to Rome. An example of how local communities might, uh, sorry, how local politics might play out in acts of defection can be seen in an anecdote from Appian's Hannibalic War. Appian tells us that Hannibal was eager to bring Italian forces with them to Africa as they were exceptionally well-drilled and would therefore be an asset in his attempt to defend his homeland. Now, when Hannibal asked his Italian troops to join him, he got two different responses. The soldiers who were, quote, guilty of crimes against their own country, unquote, were willing to accompany him. But those who were not so, um, who had not, um, but those who were, were not so eager and instead wanted to return home. Here we have evidence of two separate acts of defection motivated by local politics. On one hand, the incident provides evidence of Italian soldiers in Hannibal's army who had defected to the Carthaginian army as an act of rebellion against their own city-states. And as a result of their action were considered personae non gratae in their own communities. On the other hand, we have Italian soldiers who joined Hannibal as part of a political initiative of their community. Um, and they had decided to desert to his ca cause because their local motivations were no longer served by the war at hand. That is, they left Hannibal's army because it wasn't beneficial to them. These communities, though they lent their support to Hannibal while in Italy, were unwilling to continue their support of the Carthaginian commander after he left Italy. The fact that these states were concerned about Carthaginian success in Italy, but not outside of it, strongly suggests that the support of Hannibal had nothing to do with a desire to defeat the Romans, but rather the possibility of using his invasion as a means to reconfigure local political structures. Acknowledging that local political concerns may well have conditioned defection may help us to make sense of a curious detail about our historical record of the phenomenon. In a number of cases, the individuals or groups that defected did so in the very regions from which they hailed. We have a particularly plentiful record of allied soldiers defecting in Italy during the Second Punic War. And the same can be said of Spanish auxiliaries in the various conflicts in Hispania in our period. Nor do Italy or Hispania seem to be special. We find notices of Greek and African soldiers switching sides when fighting on their home turf. Given the diversity of the men who served in Rome's army during the Republic, the correlation between the identity of the deserter and the place of desertion suggests that local concerns, amongst other factors, may have been at play in many of these defections. So one more instance of an enemy consorting with non-Roman soldiers and affecting collective action from the Second Punic War highlights um, another key factor that helped allied and auxiliary troops to take political action. The story is that of a desertion of a group of Celtiberian soldiers from, the Roman, from a Roman army operating in 211 BCE. Libby, who records the incident in detail, tells us that the action was brought about by a combination of bribes from Hasdrubal and the constant conversation between the Celtiberians and their Spanish counterparts in the Carthaginian army. And once again, these deserters were soldiers who were recruited from an area that had just been brought under Roman control. But Livy acknowledges there was another um, important, more practical factor that enabled the desertion of these troops. The lack of legionary soldiers in the detachment in which the Celtiberians were uh, serving. Because of this numerical imbalance, Livy reports that the Celtiberians had, quote, no fear at all as it pertained to the Romans, since they were so few in number. 
and they couldn't do so if, quote, they should try to stop them by force. This point of view was apparently shared by the commander of the detachment as well. According to Libby, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio saw any attempt to stop them from deserting as ultimately futile. Okay, so let me pause for a second. I realize I've forgotten my computer charger and I don't want this to die on us halfway through. So give me um, one second to fix this. Okay, I'm sorry about that. So to return to um, this incident in 211, where we have Celtiberian soldiers uh, defecting from the Roman army and going over to the Carthaginian army due to numerical circumstances that, i.e., um, they were way more numerous and there's nothing the Romans could do to stop them. And so the reason for the numerical imbalance here was due to the nature of the war in Spain at the time. According to Livy, um, the forces that had previously been under the, the command of the brother Scipiones had to be split to face off against two separate Carthaginian armies stationed in Spain, one commanded by Mago and the other by Hasdrubal. Publius advanced to face the Carthaginian troops commanded by Mago, taking with him two thirds of the Roman and allied troops. While, but while Gnaeus retained the remaining third of these troops and the newly recruited Celtiberian soldiers to face off against Hasdrubal. As a result, Gnaeus's army was left um, with a set of troops who consisted largely of new recruits and did not have particularly positive feelings towards the Romans. While it was the particularities of the Spanish theater in the Second Punic War that led to this numerical imbalance, and thereby enabled the Celtiberian soldiers to desert. Libby thinks that this is um, an issue that was rather common. As a coda to the Celtiberian desertion, Libby states that such a situation ought to always be a cause of concern for Roman commanders. And these examples ought to be borne in mind as a reminder that they should not trust foreign soldiers to such a degree that they do not have more of their own forces and men in camp. While Libby's statement here is obviously aimed at providing advice to commanders operating in the first century BCE, we know that Roman forces often featured more non-Roman soldiers than their legionary counterparts during the Middle Republic. Indeed, Jonathan Prague has shown that one of the ways that the Romans dealt with the fact that their manpower was stretched thin by multi-front wars was by deploying ethnically organized garrisons or detachments. The over-reliance on non-Roman soldiers in these roles and its connections with the massive manpower requirements of Roman warfare opened up the possibility for resistance and rebellion in two different ways. It provided the necessary time and space for non-Roman soldiers to develop bonds with one another, um, necessary to take collective action. But it also meant that these soldiers did not have to fear for retribution or punishment on a part of um, the Roman overlords. Outnumbered commanders were unable to put a stop to these actions and reinforcements that could be used to monitor or stop such plots were not available due to Rome's many military commitments. And um, one last kind of anecdote will we'll show this once again, but also kind of add a different flair to the story. The, the famous story of the takeover of Regium in 280 by um, a Legio Campana in the Pyrrhic War highlights how Roman over, lack of Roman oversight gave allied and auxiliary soldiers opportunities for political agency. Our sources on that uh, episode report that in the late 280s, a detachment of a few thousand Campanian soldiers under the, camp, uh, the command of Decius Vibelius was sent by the Romans to garrison Regium, which had appealed to Rome for protection against either Pyrrhus 
or the powerful South Italian communities of Tarentum and Brutium. After a few years in Regium without incident, the Campanian soldiers massacred and expelled its inhabitants and took over the town for themselves. However, in spite of their actions, the Campanian soldiers remained in the control of the town for several years. The Romans were occupied with the war against Pyrrhus and the Greeks in southern Italy. It was only once these difficulties had died down that the Romans sent an army to besiege Regnum, which ultimately defeated the garrison after a protracted engagement. Most of the rebellious soldiers at Regium were killed in the siege, but the few who survived were sent to Rome where they were publicly decapitated in the forum. It appears that the takeover of Regium by these soldiers was not so much an act of political resistance, but rather one of local politics. As Bruno Bleckman has recently demonstrated, the capture of the city fits well with what we know of Campanian politics during this period. There appears to have been a concerted effort on a part of various Campanian polities to gain a foothold in Sicily and Southern Italy in the fourth and third centuries BCE. Our sources, both literary and epigraphic, speak of the establishment of settlements at towns such as Antella, Nacone, and Messana. In all these cases, it was Campanian soldiers who were fighting in these areas as mercenaries who played a key role in the politi this politics of expansion. They directly took part in the foundation and development of these settlements. In this context, the actions of the soldiers at Regium represent another attempt on a part of the Campanian military forces at expansion in regions directly south of their homeland. What's more, um, we have further sort of evidence for this point of view from the fact that our sources report that the um, Campanian soldiers there actually um, struck a treaty with troops at Regium and um, who, sorry, that's sorry, uh, our sources note that the troops at Regium signed a treaty with their countrymen at Messana upon seizing the town. Sorry. So um, the troops at Regium signed a treaty with their fellow Campanians at Messana after they took the town. Now, we see again here how Roman absence enables allied and auxiliary soldiers to take political action. They have the time, they have the space, and they have the opportunities to uh, act politically. And so now at this point, since we've taken up the better part of an hour, I wanna move on to some final thoughts. Um, to recap, what we have seen is that the nature of military service in the Middle Republic put allied and auxiliary soldiers in situations where they could and did take political action. Indeed, the Romans not only recruited its former enemies, but the nature of Roman war making meant that these enemies had access to an alternative to Roman rule and were often left to their own devices. These, the, these actions, um, or sorry, these circumstances resulted in actions that were wide ranging in scope and scale. Some aimed at more global goals, such as resistance to Roman rule, and others at more locally oriented objectives at a factional, polis, and regional level. Now, this, I, I wanna kind of conclude by leaving off with a couple of observations and questions that I haven't quite yet figured out. So um, first, thinking geographically and culturally, I wonder if there's a reason, and we can see this in the examples I've cited, why Spanish and Italian soldiers seem to have taken part in the politics of resistance in this period more than say their Greek counterparts who we know served in Roman armies as well. Perhaps it speaks to Rome's constant military occupation of these regions and the constant use and abuse of the lands and peoples um, therein. Second, thinking chronologically, I'm curious as to whether the reduction of large scale acts of resistance like conspiracy and desertion on the part of the allies in the second century BCE compared to the third is a source issue or representative of a historical phenomenon. For instance, um, we might be inclined to think that the political possibilities for allied soldiers were reduced the further they were fighting away from home. And, the and, and we might also think that as time went on, the possibility of casting off Roman rule seemed more and more unlikely. And it leads me to the question of whether the 
the inability of the soldiers to enact this type of resistance maybe led to a bubbling up of tension that eventually erupted in the social war. And my last kind of rumination here is thinking about, again, the paucity of our historical archive. And I wonder the extent to which these political interests that I've laid out um, throughout this paper may have motivated soldiers to take part in acts of collective disobedience like mutinies or, um, or just sort of not obeying their commander together with Roman soldiers. In other words, can we see if events that involve entire armies also being implicated in the local and global politics of allies and auxiliary soldiers. Um, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much for listening and I'm excited to hear your comments and questions. Thank you, thank you, Dominic. That's a, a very wonderful paper, a uh, true provoking paper. Uh, um, well, uh, I guess there will be lot, plenty of questions. Uh, so, well, I renovate, I repeat, so I made my real thinking to you and leave the floor, I leave the floor to our colleagues. If there are questions, observation, please don't be shy. maybe they are still thinking well uh, well uh, I, have, I have an observation well it, it's um, okay 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 mine later so uh, I think the first was Cristina Cristina Michele and Federico okay Oops. so yes well, Cristina I please uh, yeah no. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much Dominic that was brilliant uh, I've got just one question to what extent um, do you think there was an oral memory in those groups who revolted or in the communities? You know, like 30 years ago, a group of people from this community revolted against the Romans and things like that. To what, what extent do you think that was somehow uh, conserved, preserved in those military auxilia and then passed on through later groups? So, it, you know, it, it felt like, you know, you are not the first one and it has been done um, somehow. Yeah, I think that's a great question. How do we, what do we know about um, memory on a part on a part of these um, groups, right? What do we know about Samnite memories of resistance and, and things like that? Um, and I wonder again, if this is something that fades out over time, maybe this is part of the explanation why we might say see fewer Italian acts of resistance over the course of say the second century compared with the third. Right, maybe um, there's kind of this, I guess, when talking of early Roman history, we talk about the three generation rule, right? There's a, you can remember the stories of three generations before you, right? So as long as we're within that scope of sort of um, oral memory, we might imagine that um, these stories were relevant. So that's one way of thinking of it, that these are stories that are passed on. Um, we might wonder ways in which they might have been commemorated within towns. And, and we know that um, there's some instances where we have evidence of people, you know, we can see the Etruscans right on their tombs commemorating wars with the Romans, right? So that lives very much in their physical memory there. So that's, that's kind of one thought that I might have on that topic. Thank you. Uh, Michele. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Dominic, for the uh, fascinating paper. And I have just a couple of questions, if I, I may. And uh, well, the first one is um, about what you were saying on the differences between um, the Italian situation in the third and second century. And uh, I can recall that Livy says that in the years immediately following the end of the Second Punic War, uh, Italian allies were allowed to participate in the foundation of Latin colonies mm -hmm. just in the years immediately following the conflict. So um, do you think there is something working here so they were included just for a reward for not having revolted against Rome and so there was some kind of renegotiation with this part of the communities uh, of this might be an example. 
of this kind of negotiation. And the second question is on, uh, uh, on Polybius. Uh, it does not mention the conspiracy of uh, 259. And uh, why do you think he does not mention? And do you think that this lack of information also has to deal with the lack of information on uh, Greek uh, revolts in the army as well? Yeah, excellent. So um, yeah. on your point about renegotiation, I think um, the question of how Rome related to its allies between um, conquest and the social war is something that we're still very much thinking through. And I think what, at least my, my point of view on this is that it's much more complex. We can't, we can't go, uh, we, we can't rely on resistance and integration as sort of the only two modes. They're one of, they're, those two modes are kind of interconnected and working together at the same time. So um, just again, thinking from the military perspective, we know that um, a lot of allied communities celebrated service in the Roman army, right? It was a part of a point of local pride. It was a point that was commemorated. Um, and at the same time, so I think some of the Roman incentivizations, including what you're talking about there, Michele, with the um, colonial allowing um, the allies to be part of a colony, right, is part of that incentivization scheme. I don't think it always worked, right? I don't think it's it was a it was sort of a one track kind of thing, right? Okay, the Romans did this, and now everything was okay. Um, I think there's probably again we lose sight here of all the community-based differences that we have. So within a certain town, we have different people believing different things about what the relationship to Rome should be. And we see that mediated through many different um, sources. So I think um, there, at least my thought on what's going on in the second century is that with Hannibal, you have this great opportunity to actually change what's going on in Italy. With the wars that are going on in Italy, you actually have the opportunity to change or, or to possibly affect change on Roman hegemony. Once we get beyond that, when you're in Spain, if you're an allied soldier, what benefit do you possibly get for rebelling in Spain, right? Is there a possibility you can see outside of sort of, um, you know, sort of what do you get from that? Is it your own freedom? You just don't want to participate in Roman warfare anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder if maybe it's, uh, a situation where these we might see these revolts that happened as kind of um, opening a cap of soda a little bit to lead to release the pressure right but when we have a second century where there's no opportunities to resist or rebel against rome in a sort of military circumstance maybe it builds up to a point of pressure where you get to the social war again these are just very preliminary thoughts um polybius um Polybius is notor uh, on Polybius in 259, he's notorious for leaving out these kind of popular instances of rebellion and resistance. I think it's just he's not concerned with that. And I wonder to what extent he thinks that that might run counter to his grand narrative that he presents in book six, that the Romans are disciplined, they're ordered, their soldiers do what they say, and therefore that's what's going on. Um, I think Polybius is not the most sensitive reader of the frustrations that the Italians had with Roman rule. Um, he kind of presents it as like, wow, they, this works better than maybe the Greek system does, but it doesn't mean that things were particularly good. At least that's my, my read on the situation. Okay, thank you very much. So Federico, Thanks very much. And thanks very much, Dominic. It's a really wonderfully thought-provoking paper. I've got two comments and a question. Um, first comment, it seems to me that you have a provincialized Italy, mm -hmm. a provincialized Republican Italy. Um, that is historiographically a rather important operation. It's bound to be a controversial one. Uh, it runs against the great even of work like Terrenato, but you've actually argued quite effectively, my view, that in many ways, um, the realities of Republican Italy are closely comparable to those of, say, Spain. Um, 
I, I think that, that is worth noting, and I, I do wonder whether you have any any thoughts on that. Um, second comment: um, the second century gap, which of course is is close to the concerns of many of us in this in this virtual room. Um, the um, second century is clearly a time when, as, as you also just noted, the opportunities for sort of effective resistance or opposition to Rome seem to be narrowing, uh, seem to be closing down, that the, the techniques of Roman oppression seem to become increasingly effective. Uh, and so the see the Roman Roth has explored in that brilliant AJP paper a few years ago. But it's also, of course, a century in which uh, the Italic diaspora in the Eastern Mediterranean, and not just in the Eastern Mediterranean, seems to be really gaining momentum. Uh, and where, if you if you buy Gabba's old argument, the opportunities for interaction between uh, Romans and Roman citizens and Italians increase under the umbrella term of Romaioi. And it is certainly also the, the time when you have that major burst of accumulation that makes the war effort of the of the Italian coalition in 91 possible. Um, so clearly, clearly is, is a time that where our archives are far less rich than we would like them to be, but where a number, a number of things do happen and, and do complicate the, 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 the picture. Um, the question, to, to move to the genuine question. Um, yes, you have provincialized Italy, you have politicized those Italian communities, and I think we can in this context also shell the term tribe, which I think has a derogatory slant. Uh, these, these are clearly communities where politics happens. Um, where, where, uh, and and um, at the end, you did touch upon the um, comparability uh, between Italy and, and, and Greece. Mm -hmm. Now, especially sort of having, having read uh, uh, the recent book by John Thornton on Polybius, and having been reminded of the very rich dossier for you know, rather, rather messy political life of those polities, actually, I do wonder whether the comparison might be attempted and effectively ca be carried out um, in between, uh, between Italy and, uh, and the Greek polities of the uh, yeah, late third, second century BC. But I wonder whether you have any, any thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, those, so um, provincializing Italy, I, I, I think that's a good way of putting that, I think, and maybe that might be one way to compare, say, third century Italy versus second century Italy. And I think that kind of is relates to your two comments there that um, Italy perhaps is different or changing, at least in the second century, in ways that um, maybe Spain in the second century is not. Um, Greek communities, that, and, and this is one that has troubled me a bit. We know, we hear a lot about Greek communities taking political action as communities, right? We hear a lot about um, states siding with Rome, states not siding with Rome, the consequences that come with it. Um, and of course, their allegiance and support of Rome often came with soldiers attached to it. Um, you know, we supplied 500 troops for X, right? And we write it up in an inscription. So I guess um, there's certainly a local political area, but I think the, 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 uh, certainly local politics very much going on. I think the perspective that I'm driving at here and, and sort of, um, again, to put it into context, this is um, a part of a chapter from um, my monograph where the, the goal here is to kind of draw a picture of the, of Roman soldiers as a collective as being sort of a locus of popular power. So I do agree that many of those same politicized debates are going on in Greece. And I think they're very much happening. We don't get as good of a view of what the Greek soldiers are doing, right? And, and how those different um, mentalities are factoring in, uh, you know, and, and I wonder about mercenaries, right? How does Greek mercenary service make it easier to go and fight with Rome, right, at this point, right? You just say, okay, well, it's just a different polity that I'm going and serving under or fighting under. But um, those are just sort of my kind of very disorganized thoughts on what's going on with Greek communities. And, and um, yeah, and the Italic diaspora is something, again, just to, to briefly touch on that, the second part of this chapter looks at 
displacement also, right? So a lot of these soldiers end up either settling in or being settled in Italy or abroad, even in Spain, right? We know that soldiers were settled in Spain during this period, whether they were colonies or not, that's a whole separate thing, but it also, um, there's a politics involved there, right? Where these, these uh, individuals get, and, and these groups as soldiers, they get elevated politically, they get politically privileged by being, you know, again, to return to McKelley's point, as colonists. Okay. Okay, thank you to both. Well, we do have questions, fortunately, well, I'm delighted. Uh, I think the order is Pedro, Roman, and Christoph if I'm not mistaken. So please, Pedro. Well, uh, hello, uh, congratulations, Dominic, for your wonderful paper, which I, I admire really. Um, I have been uh, thinking about uh, the issue of civil wars, Roman civil wars for some time. And I think that there might be some connection here. The point is that, uh, some authors, uh, particularly uh, Calibas on violence in, in civil wars, they uh, stated, uh, they think that uh, in civil wars, the, the people took side mostly because of their uh, private connections, not when they uh, go to war with their peers, no, their kin, their fathers, their uh, brothers, their neighbors, and so on. No? So I wonder whether the same could be applied also here. For example, when uh, an, a rebellion has erupted, uh, one goes to war because uh, he's a Lucanian, no? and he has to fight with Lucanians. No? And as you pointed out, the uh, Roman um, the Roman system no? tend to group uh, these people together. No? So maybe... Uh, in fact, it was also uh, something that uh, made re rebellions, so to speak, uh, easier, but also, in a sense, and that's my question, depoliticize them. No, they were they were fighting not because they were against Rome or other particular local issues, but because they were there, they were Lucanians in my example. No? That's, mm -hmm. That would be my question. Thank you. Great. No, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. So thinking of, um, warfare as being something underwritten by private rather than political connections. And I, and I certainly, I guess my response to that would be that I think those two explanations can coexist. And I think that um, we can certainly acknowledge that part of the reason that some of these people and groups took part in these events, right, may not have been political. Oh, all of my fellow Samnites are doing X. Right. Therefore, I will do that. And what I guess my my thought is that political political motivation and political action are kind of um, they're very closely interconnected, but not completely overlapping. So political an action can be political even if the actors don't necessarily intend it to be. Would be my would be my um, point. So I do definitely take the point that. Um, Private connections may be um, may explain a lot of the reasons why you see um, these groups taking part in it, and I think that can be that can certainly I can use that to my advantage to kind of say we don't even need to acknowledge that all of these people have to be politically motivated to take political action. If that if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Roman. Please. Um, thank you, um, Mattia, and thank you, uh, Dominic, for a really interesting and very thought-provoking paper. I um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I have a sort of a comment rather than a fully blown question. And I was thinking about the, your second century Italians who desert when they're in Spain. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's a, you know, the classic example, really. I mean, and if, you, if, if we then think, as you also emphasized that, you know, the in very emphatically, the Allies are responsible for the re recruitment of their own soldiers. And that if we look at, yeah, for example, if we believe mm -hmm. Fal Falschifter's argument, you know, that, you know, these, these part participation and successful warfare is actually a source of pride, local pride. 
wouldn't it then be sort of a possibility that in fact what they are doing they are in fact deserting from their own um contingents locally rather than from the roman army hmm. um and how would that fit into your argument or your argument yeah and i think so this is this is a, a an interesting question so um and i think for my argument my my thoughts are that we at least what I'm calling local politics exists at a, a, a variety of different levels. So you have the factional, what we might call within the community, mm -hmm. right? Sort of, oh my, you know, I was signed up to fight this war by X, Y, and Z, by whoever it is, right? I, it might be it's a, you know, the statesman in my town. I disagree with him, right? And I think that certainly is the case. So I think that speaks to that example I, I, I talked of, where, of the Italian soldiers who had gone over to Hannibal and um, we have the two groups, the ones who decide to stay with him and go to Africa, and the ones who um, remain in Italy. And the ones who decide to go with him in Africa, they are persona non grata in their states, right? They're, they're thought to have committed a crime against their state. So I like very much that reading of um, seeing it as a local explanation. And maybe it's something I should um, foreground also as, as um, cause I can, local politics and resistance, global politics may coexist. And I think it's something that I might just foreground as part of an explanation of what might be happening. It's not just a priori, okay, resistance, but it's also an act that signals, at least for the Italian soldiers, um, a rejection of the certain local politics that, are, that has been going on to have them conscribed. Right to have them conscripted into the Roman army. Does that kind of get to? Um, yeah, yeah, I think. I, th I think so. Yeah, I think I, I think that sort of I think actually works quite nicely with your overall argument. And I, I also, I mean, if you think about the um, the Incensi and the um, the the Lex Oscar, the Tabula Bantina. There's a good paper by um, Lukasha on it. Um, you know, that sort of people who get very harshly punished. People in um, in um, in Bantia who who refuse to be who are based deserters, but who used to be recruited. Very high, harsh punishment. So I think that's, that's worth looking into. But thank you so much. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so, thank you. Well, uh, I think the Locascio paper was not published. <laughs> it's uh, still, uh, well, it circulated in a different way, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's, no? it's, it's, it came out? Uh, very recently, two, I think. Very recently, yeah. Two years yeah. ago or something, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, please, Christoph. Well, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed this and I, I like the approach that via Chakrabati, you're enriching our understanding by looking at collective actions and looking at non-elite history. Um, I, I, I would say that's, that's a small comment that non-elite history is, I mean, your paper showed that quite brilliantly, is something else than local politics. The, the kind of Fronda argument, I think, is still based on an elite reading of local cities, whereas you actually used two different approaches together, if I'm not mistaken. But that's, that's kind of more a, a common um, because I needed to, to, to hear my voice saying it aloud to understand it. Um, the, the, the question really is on, on a small level um what about the context of the authors mm -hmm. if we go back to 218 um polybius versus livy yes um i don't know i just believe polybius and don't believe livy and now <laughs> let's let's figure out why um now i mean isn't this idea of the celtic identity a kind of augustan based argument when italy becomes a I don't know, the, the light motif for everything. Whereas Polybius has a clear understanding that if you change sides, you have to show the new side that you are not changing sides again. So cutting off the heads is not only maybe a terrific way of showing your Celtic identity, but it's also a way of making sure you can't go back. So that's the only way the other side is actually believing that you're not changing loyalties again. So that would be a really um, um, different way of putting it. Um, and 
the other argument question would be, wouldn't it be for Polybius also quite possible to play this from his Greek background with different Greek polis? He could have easily played this identity card as well. Mm. And if he doesn't, um, that, that, that's also, I think, that's a, that's a telling lacuna. Well, yeah, that's a great question. And, and my reading of this is, um, I think it's a, and again, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it's definitive at all, but my, my reading of Polybius saying that the, the Celts made the decision that based on who was the stronger side, this is something that Polybius comes back to time and again in almost every war he describes, right? Okay. Um, with the Greeks, they're trying to decide, you know, there, there's the famous speech of Philip where they see the clouds in the West and they're trying to figure out whether it's the Carthaginians or the Romans who are going to be the stronger power. And they have a debate about who that's going to be. And there's this constant set of uh, questions about uh, who's stronger and if you're sort of adjacent to the war at hand, how do you make a decision that puts you in the best place after the war to make political negotiations? And I think that's a point he's trying to make. Um, I do think that um, my, 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 my sort of historical response to Polybius is that if it's just about which side is stronger, right? Soldiers can make that decision, but not necessarily affect their communities, right? So there are a lot of times soldiers will desert precisely because one side is stronger, but then we see all the other Celtic communities make that same decision. And then we see Roman warfare against um, the Celts in the aftermath of the Second Punic War. So um, even if it is a, um, you know, we can believe Polybius, there are certain political aspects that underlie that decision and that are sort of historically uh, borne out. Okay. Well, uh, Emilio. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dominic, for this uh, very fascinating paper. Uh, I will stay as Christopher's uh, comment, I will stay in, in on matter of methodology, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, and I have to admit this, that's a bit of a self-interested uh, consideration because I've been using a lot of collective actions and I've been trying to figure out, well, in, in a much more obvious context, which is the urban context, uh, in the late Republic, but I've been trying to figure out how they affect uh, the community and how they affect the life of the community. So uh, in this respect, I, I don't know the, the, uh, the author, uh, you've, uh, Chakrabati, uh, to, to, to whom you have appealed, uh, but I've been trying to work with the idea of hegemony in, in a dialectical way, top and bottom of society. Uh, so my question would be, uh, how do you read the, the collective actions in terms of political communication, impact on public opinion, on what communities, if only on the local, on the army, or also on the broader Roman community? Mm -hmm. And if this means to you that these groups developed a sort of subjectivity, or if they were just, I don't know, sort of spontaneous collective actions at a, at a given time? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, great question. So um, on, I'll, I'll touch on that last point here. Um, one of, and, and again, I trace this out a bit more in, in the monograph is that um, one of Chakrabarthi's key points is that um, collective action can be effective and political and spontaneous at the same time. That's kind of one of the things that makes it so hard to uh, control and police and makes it so powerful and you know, sort of from the level of hegemony, right? If you're a member of the elite and you carefully as, as sort of um, Holkuskamp or Morsi and Marx have shown, right? Constructed a set of political patterns, a set of political rituals, so such that your power is more or less unimpeachable, at least if you're proceeding along traditional lines, you need to kind of work outside of that. Um, and you need to have opportunities to work um, beyond kind of the traditional, okay, well, voting or showing up in a contio. So that's one of the reasons I found Chakrabarthi appealing is because it allows us to kind of circumvent, oh, well, there were these particular political procedures 
put in place. Therefore, we can't imagine non-elite or collective agency, right? Um, but if we think that, and, and one of the, again, to get to Chakrabarthy, he, he says that um, our idea that politics is rational is basically an enlightenment idea. And um, if we, but if we actually drill down, um, politics often is not rational. Um, actions can be politically meaningful without following traditional, you know, sort of um, traditional rules. So I think of, I think of these groups as, so I kind of try to, and again, as someone who is trained as a you know, in an enlightenment-based institution, right? It's hard to get out of that, um, that rule, that sort of um, rule of thumb. But what I try to do, at least when I'm thinking of collective action, is I try to remember that it can exist outside of traditional political frameworks and that it is powerful because of that, but that we can still think about how political frameworks shape and shift things. So, um, one of my big arguments is that collective action is something that is required by the Roman army to be effective. Um, it's not a top-down command structure, but basically you rely on these units, maniples, um, sentries to do, their, um, to do their job on the battlefield. You require a lot of cohesion, a lot of coordination, and there's a lot of sort of um, ideological priming for that. But um, at the same time, right, if you're ready to take collective action on the battlefield, Right, and you're able to make those decisions on your own. That does open up other possibilities. So, um, and and one of the one of the possibilities that I, I wanted to show today was here's politics enacted by um, allied and auxiliary troops, and and I also expanded to sort of um, you know what we might call domestic politics, economic and social concerns, and and things of that nature. So um, this is, and I think. Um, one of the parts that was hardest about thinking about what I wanted to say today is this is the last chapter of the book. So it's kind of, you've seen a bunch of examples at this point. So the argument carries hopefully a little bit more weight in that context, but those are those, that's my thought on, on that, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. well, to both. Uh, well, uh, Lisa, please. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Dominic, for your paper. Um, I think in part you've already answered my question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> um, and so you seem to be in your argument really invested in showing that the actions that these soldiers took individually, but also collectively were political, right? And you thought a lot about what you mean by, by what it takes for an action to be political. Um, and so I was just wondering if if you could sort of parse out a bit more what's actually at stake in that. Why do you care so much right. about right. showing that these things, you, you know, that, you know, sort of writing this into, in, into politics and some, right? And, and, yeah. mm -hmm. and just sort of for a bit of, ba of background at the beginning of your paper, I was thinking, well, look, I mean, they're writing. How can this not be political, right? right. That there is sort of thing about <laughs> why, Right? Why, why this effort to sort of demonstrate this at length um, yeah. and, and, and sort of pass out the different politics that you might see? Um, so yeah, if you could just maybe- see No, that, that that's, a, that's a great question. Yeah, and I mean, I think I'm probably the wrong person here to ask um, to define political in, in a Roman Republican sense. Since Amy's here, I'm sure she could, um, she has lots of thoughts on that. But my, my rationale, my reason behind this is we sort of, you know, uh, we think of Roman warfare, right? The, the process of conquest, the expansion that went on as being so essential to the history of the Roman Republic, especially in the third and second centuries BCE. But um, the personage of the soldier due in large part to our sources has more or less been struck from that history, right? Um, soldiers are, they exist as sort of these robots who go out and conquer the Mediterranean and they come back, they follow orders, they do all that stuff. Um, my goal is to kind of at least, um, the larger goal of this project is to add some texture to that picture. And um, one, of the, one of the key parts of that is saying, if we're going to recognize these soldiers as being powerful in, uh, as members of the army, I wanna recognize that they're also kind of, um, 
they have powers beyond that. Um, and th this, and this to me is important because I, again, um, to kind of get back to what I was mentioning to Emilio, I, I'm interested in this debate about the political character of the Roman Republic and, and kind of pushing back a little bit against the Holcus camp um, and others model, again, not to just make him sort of a, um, a straw man almost, but the sort of idea that we're looking at a top-down system of government and thinking about agency in different ways, right? Um, Miller did such a, a, an interesting, some interesting work working with Polybius and working with the, um, the Contio, and we've seen the limits of that. But I think if we break out of some of the more traditional um, avenues for thinking about political action, right? Um, we can gain a better sense of popular power in the Republican period. I don't think it has to be, well, the Roman Republic was a democracy or it was, a, you know, whatever we want to call it, but there were avenues and there were ways for us to kind of um, acknowledge that they have popular power, um, to acknowledge that um, people other than the state, the sort of aristocratic stakeholders could take action and could shape um, the way that the Roman state was working in this crucial time period. And I think if we're willing to accept that with their role as, you know, sort of uh, cannon fodder, we have to be willing to accept that that's possible in other areas too. Does that answer your question, Lisa? Uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, uh, we have also a question from Emmy, please. Well, I just, since I was mentioned, I thought I, uh, um, I don't know that I'm uh, necessarily the person to define the political, but I just, I, I mean, first of all, I really love this paper. And then what you were just saying, Dominic, about, um, uh, you know, how the political gets defined in, you know, the last 20 years of scholarship, um, well, probably 50 years of scholarship, really. Um, but also, also in our own sources, right? And you know, maybe everyone in this room has, you know, managed to escape this trap. But I think we, I think it's just so good to constantly remind ourselves. There's a great quotation from O'Neill. I mean, his paper about Circuli, where he talks about, uh, is it his paper about Circuli? Or is it paper about uh, Catiline? But he he talks about how the representation of the plebs as subpolitical served as a powerful strategy in the maintenance of the political hegemony of the Roman upper classes, right? And this is, you know, it's just so easy to fall into that. That mode, and uh, and I think you know the, the 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 Miller the Miller debate is not over, right? We're we're still we're still working in that in the, in that framework, and so um, the kind of Chakrabarti um, mode of recognizing group action as fundamentally political is is a provocation, but I think it's one that in our discipline we still really really need, and it's you know it's easy to all sit around together in a group like this and say yeah 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 we all get it, but actually you know. Is that constantly in our minds as we're writing about this stuff? I think I think it's very important to 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 keep emphasizing that. So I'd just really like to thank Dominic for that. Thank you very much for this uh, for this remark. Well, would you like to add something, Dominic? No, I think that's totally right, and I'm I'm glad to hear um, Amy say that because I know that you've been working and thinking a lot about what we mean when we say race publica, right? Because this is a big, again, assumption that we make about what exactly are we talking about or, um, you know, when we when we talk about the Roman Republic and, and what considers that. So I think um, it's heartening that you guys, that, that I've heard some positive comments because it's, again, in the, when we hear the voice of this debate and we hear where we go and we hear how politics is defined, it oftentimes is wonder, it, it leads me to wonder, are my working uphill in trying to make this argument? So I'm appreciative of the, the positive comments that, that um, I've received. So thank you guys. Well, are you tired or may, may no, I- No, go ahead, well, this, is, this is great. This is fantastic. Okay, may I, may I make a short comment rather than a question? Yes, oh, please. Very short. Um, I was thinking about the first slide you have shown um, on uh, about Rosius and Zonaras. Mm -hmm. I, I presume that uh, uh, their account is based on the lost book of Livy, I think. The original source can be Livy, no? Uh, well, um, the term conspiracy, you mm -hmm. use the term conspiracy. In Latin is coniuratio, probably. Yeah. 
Uh, and you, I think I totally agree with you uh, when you say that is uh, it's not a conspiracy. Well, it can be interpreted correctly as a political resistance, political movement, uh, this uh, form of dissent from non-elite uh, people. But your interpretation uh, and confront confronting your interpretation with this passage it made me think to the other great conspiracy of the mid republic and this so-called Bacchanalian affair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In which case we have, in that case, this, the same model, uh, slaves, women, uh, Italians, which were interpreted by the senatorial uh, sources as con new rates. Oh. So this, see, this it's a very, um, a very interesting example how, how, how it's difficult to uh, use senatorial sources to interpret the popular moments. Well, yeah. It was not really properly a question, way, oh, but no, 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 precisely. And I think that's that's what we're we're striving to do is how do we write this kind of history when our sources are have their own set of tropes and ways of otherizing that precise type of history. So no, I think that's a that's a brilliant example. And um, I mentioned briefly um, the revolt at Setia that happens in in one ninety eight. That um, and then there's I think. Another one, another slave revolt that breaks out in Apulia in 185. Yeah. If I'm not, yeah. yeah. And again, following right on the heels of the Bacchanalian conspiracy. And um, I think, um, who is that? Who? I'm forgetting. Amy Richland um, talks a lot about this in her book on Plautus and, and slave theater, right? Is who are these enslaved people who are being imported to Italy, right? They're former soldiers, they're um, trying to process you know, sort of a lot of what happened to them. There's this great um, passage, I, I mean, the great is a, is a wrong word to use here, but in the, in Plutarch's biography of Flamininus, when he's going through Greece and he sees all these captured Romans who he can't, who he can't do anything with. And thinking about, again, all these people who are living in Italy, in, throughout the empire, who were fighting against Rome and are now enslaved, I'm, and I think we can, and I've done this in later periods where we can trace connections between sort of um, actions of enslaved people and um, other sort of provincial or, or non-Roman peoples as well. So I'm curious to what extent those connections were actually there, right? Are um, Carthaginians who are being held captive thinking about resistance? I, I can't quite answer that question, I don't think, but um, it's something that's, that's in the back of my brain. And we have also we have also another um, well not properly a revolt but a manslaughter uh, at the end at the, the, oof, the middle of the second century in the Silla in the Silla woods no um, yeah uh, slaves and uh, free laborers um, killed a lot of people we don't know it's a criminal right. affair right. well right. but in this case there were a sort of, sort of violence from these mm -hmm. uh, people in the Bacchanalian affair the violence came from the consul. I yes. think we don't know yeah. well if the conurates were violent or not. Yeah, there and, and uh, well, absolutely no. I and I think one one interesting example I'll, I'll add to this point is the shepherds. Shepherds always um, show up in all of these various conspiracies, and um, there's been some interesting work on uh, the racialization of shepherds. So the idea that they're these evil people who cause bad things to happen. Um, so I'm curious, I, that's something, again, I've been thinking about, and how does it connect with this, um, this larger context in the Middle Republic? The Bacchanalia is fascinating because we actually have Livy calling them quasi alta populus, right? Yeah. That he's, uh, he, in this, this moment where he's expressing that the, the fear is be precisely because he can recognize this as political and how that, you know, how, how that lines up to what actually happened um, at the time is, 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 is a different question. But from Livy's perspective, um, yeah. it's, it's very clear that that's the motivation behind the fear. It's really interesting. Because it's, it's really clear because they, they, didn't, they didn't have an army. They didn't attempt to um, candidate for the consulship. Well, they, will be, they were interpreted as well, probably the senatorial sources uh, interpret the uh, other people, uh, people making something politically, uh, which were not ca coming from the elite. We, they were other things, probably. This is the problem, uh, at least. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think they were um, more interconnected than we might want to. We might want to admit, or than our sources might want to admit. I think. 
Um, now my English is becoming worse than worst. No, 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 <laughs> not time. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, are there any questions or observation or? It's quite enough. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, of course, Dominic. Thank you for your really very impressive uh, talk, uh, which, was, which was very, very stimulating, as you saw, as you see. Uh, and also thank you very much for uh, to our um, public or to our colleagues, uh, which, uh, which gave us a strong reaction uh, and a strong uh, stimulating debate. Um, so uh, I think we can uh, we can go. Just uh, um, I just announce uh, the other the next uh, meeting, which is uh, in two weeks. So uh, I think uh, 29 October, October 29. Uh, Irene Leonardis, um, translating the political clash into philosophical debates, Alagomachi between Cicero, Lucrezio, and Barro. So, see you um, between two, two weeks. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominic. Thank you. And thank you thank for everyone. You can close the recording, I think. <laughs>